we had a webinar earlier on the whole capital markets union, uh, which is the umbrella initiative. And yeah, the idea today is really to, to zoom in on the, the major initiative, uh, in, uh, priority within this initiative. Mm -hmm. So as we discussed last time, the capital markets union is anything but a new idea. On the contrary, it is precisely the pursuit of what was happening pre-crisis, that is the growth of market-based banking over traditional banking and the promotion of cross-border flows of capital, etc. Now, one of the big concerns we expressed last time was the fact that this Capital Markets Union initiative failed to integrate uh, fully the lessons from the crisis. And this is uh, a concern that we have also uh, in the context of the revival of uh, securitization. So what is securitization first? Uh, for those who don't know, uh, securitization is the practice of pulling together and repackaging a number of loans granted by a bank and then issuing tradable debt securities such as bonds uh, that are sold to investors. And then the investors who purchase the securities will be repaid when the underlying loans uh, will be reimbursed. Mm -hmm. So this is just a technique. I mean, in itself, it is neither good nor bad. Uh, it's a technique to transfer credit risk and to obtain funding. Now, when you look at it in detail, uh, we have to realize that securitization, I mean, the, the word encompasses a huge range of structures, uh, some of which are more problematic than others. Uh, <clears throat> and here, uh, that makes it important to fully integrate the lessons from the crisis, as we saw that some structures were okay, some uh, created mm -hmm. huge risk. All right. Now, why the need to revive securitizations? Well, several reasons are being put forward to revive securitizations. The first one is that it will help banks reduce their risk and will provide more funding for the real economies and small and medium enterprises in particular. Uh, regarding this claim, we must note, first of all, that banks are in a better position to lend now than before as they have increased their capital base. And secondly, uh, when we look at data from the European Central Bank, we note that there is no overall shortage of credit supply. I mean, some member states experienced difficulties uh, during the crisis due to local contexts, such as Italy, Spain, uh, Greece and Portugal. But overall, the supply of credit exceeds the demand for loans. And therefore, we find it unlikely that increasing the supply of credit will translate into significant growth and jobs. I mean, it, it might contribute, but in so far as the issue I and mean, the, the, the current lack of growth it does not come from an overall lack of credit supply, mm -hmm. it is not clear that increasing the credit supply by itself will address this issue. All right. Now, the third uh, element that uh, is being put forward is that uh, I mean the ECB ECB survey shows that the SME's main concern today is not access to funding; it is the lack of consumer demand. I mean it backs what I just said: uh, lack of and consumer demand is what is missing to boost production and create jobs. So this this data uh, backs what I just said and challenges the the official narrative. And to be clear, I mean, SMEs in some southern countries were hit hard and are still facing difficulties linked to national context. But this situation is globally improving, as we can see on the chart on the left. Now, whether on the question of whether SME loan securitization can help, well, it is widely acknowledged that SME loan securitization will be too complex to work due to the differences uh, between member states in the definition of what is an SME and due to differences in bankruptcy laws. I mean, a, a, a German SME is very different from an Italian SME and the bankruptcy laws between different member states are also very different and it will it take years, if not a decade, to address. And until that is done, it is impossible to create, to pull together and repackage pan-European uh, pools of SME loans. Okay. 
It is also widely acknowledged that SME loan securitization will be too expensive to work without subsidies, as you need to remunerate a number of intermediaries and to offer an attractive return to investors. And therefore, for all these reasons, uh, it questions the idea that securitization can be a sustainable funding alternative for SMEs. Uh, according to the European Commission, a revival of securitization will also make the economy more resilient as uh, it will reduce the reliance on bank lending and increase in turn the lending from pension funds and insurers. Now, on this argument, it is very important to bear in mind the fact that pension funds and insurers are already the biggest funders of banks currently. And if they take more risk, this may affect their ability to lend to banks should they experience big losses. And therefore, this is not a new independent source of financing uh, because these funds are highly interlinked with banks. And therefore, it questions the idea that you will make the economy more resilient. I mean, a true diversification would be truly independent funding that is not connected to banks. But that's not the case here, because we will transfer risk from banks to entities who finance banks. And in this respect, it's interesting because uh, we heard also criticism from some part of the industry on the fact that, in theory, the objective of the capital markets union is to promote capital markets. And yet, when you look at the measures, it does much more to promote market-based banking than pure capital markets, that is bond markets, equity markets, etc. But that's uh, just a side, uh, a side note. Another uh, element that uh, is important to bear in mind when we discuss the idea uh, that it will make the economy more resilient is that unlike banks that have access to public safety nets, non-bank lending entities that are that used to be referred as, to as shadow banking do not have access to these public safety nets. What that means practically is that when banks struggle to finance themselves in the market and are therefore likely to cut their lending, they can borrow at the European Central Banks who act as the lender of last resort and act in a counter-cyclical manner. I mean, when everybody wants to cut lending, they're willing to increase lending. Now, in contrast, pension funds cannot borrow at the European Central Bank, which means that there is no public entity willing to buy when everybody wants to sell, willing to lend when everybody else is cutting lending. Mm -hmm. So promoting the growth of non-bank lending without addressing this issue is therefore likely to make our financial system more vulnerable to future crises uh, with related costs in terms of GDP and growth. So again, we're not saying that it's a bad thing to promote non-bank lending. It is a good thing but it re requires, in parallel, some macro-prudential regulation to make non-bank lending stable, just as we did with bank lending uh, decades ago. Okay. Otherwise, uh, we fear that this would uh, make you know, the sources of funding for the real economy more unstable, which obviously would be a concern, and secondly, would not promote sustainable growth, which is the objective. Yes. Now, uh, so for all these reasons, we, we believe that, in fact, one of the main reasons to revive securitization is rather to improve the profitability and competitiveness of European financial institutions. I mean, securitization is indeed a very profitable activity for banks as they earn fees for manufacturing the securitization and as selling loans to investors enables them to lend several times and therefore to collect margins on loans several times. Again, it's not a bad thing. You know, competitiveness is a legitimate objective. Now, but it's not being put forward in the, in the mainstream narrative, which instead put forward arguments about SMEs and growth. And we understand that from a policymaker point of view, there are some concerns alleged or real that uh, European financial entities may be less competitive compared to US ones, etc. Mm -hmm. So we do not challenge the competitiveness objective, we just 
wish that the, the narrative were you know, more clear about what we're trying to achieve through the capital markets union and the revival of securitization. I mean, this is not about increasing lending for the real economy in our view, this is more about competitiveness. Now, as we said, as we discussed earlier, the, the Commission uh, is currently discussing uh, uh, the definition of a future good securitization, what they call simple, standardized and comparable securitization. So what is the definition being put forward? What are we talking about? Well, the first pillar is simplicity. So in order to qualify, a securitization must be simple. And what that means is that the loans in the underlying pool must be of the same type. Uh, for example, either mortgages or car loans or student loans, but no mix. And that makes it simpler for the investor to, uh, to assess the risk of the, of the product because you don't have very different types of loans. Um, so that's the first criteria. It also means uh, that the use of derivatives instruments is limited to insuring against currency and interest rate risk, but it's not, they can't, uh, you can't use derivatives instruments for betting. And lastly, uh, very complex structures such as securitization of securitizations, which we saw during the crisis, uh, are excluded from the framework. The second pillar of uh, SST, uh, Simple Securitized Transparent secu uh, Securitization, is standardization. The loans that are transferred to the securitization vehicle must be truly sold, and the underlying pool must be comprised of loans and not derivatives. What that means is just simply that the banks must actually sell the loans to the securitization vehicle, and not just buy an insurance on the loans from investors. We'll come back to that point later, but that's an important distinction. The third pillar is transparency, as it has been recognized that investors are not currently being given enough uh, detailed information in order to be able to perform the due diligence and assess the risk themselves. Um, the Commission is proposing that, the, that they're being given in the future a more uh, detailed data, loan level data, in order to incentivize them to perform uh, some uh, risk assessment before investing. And that's a very good thing. And lastly, some additional criteria are introduced to ensure that the underlying loans uh, uh, are provided to borrowers that are reasonably likely to repay them. The idea here is to avoid repeating the mistakes from the subprime episodes where loans were given to people without checking their income, assets, ability to repay, etc. So what is Finance for you uh, on this uh, definition? Well, we believe that this definition clearly goes in the right direction. I mean, it addresses some of the issues outstanding and we support all the criteria being put forward. It is, it is a good definition. However, we have several concerns. The first concern that we have is that the definition still relies explicitly on external ratings. And yet we have seen during the crisis that rating agencies could be very wrong and that relying on ratings made investors complacent uh, in their due diligence. And we understand the, 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 that the issue is not simple. I mean, if you remove the reference to external ratings, then you might uh, deter some uh, infrequent or non-expert buyers that do not have the resources to analyze the deals properly. But in our view, that would be a positive development as investors that buy products that they do not understand are more prone to change their view quickly and sell in a panic in times of stress. Mm. So it's a trade-off, but we tend to support the original idea from the Commission that we should reduce the reliance on external ratings. And at the very least, not have a um, regulation that embeds it. And in this respect, yeah, the, the, the current definition being put forward is, uh, does not go far enough. I mean, still embeds the, this reference. Mm -hmm. The second concern that we have, and one of the most important ones, is uh, that the definition of simple, standardized, transparent securitization includes tranching. And we believe that if you want the, the, the qualifying securitization to be truly simple, 
it should not include uh, this, this characteristic. So as a reminder, tranching is the technique of issuing against a pool of loans several securities with different seniorities. That is, a hierarchy that defines the order of repayment uh, in the event of non-repayment of the underlying loans. So you have, first of all, a so-called equity tranche that will uh, absorb all the losses on the underlying loan pool, and then a mezzanine tranche that will absorb the following losses, and then a senior tranche, etc. So the equity tranche that absorbs the losses uh, first is the most risky, and therefore is the one that offers the highest return. And then the mezzanine tranche is a bit less risky because you have the equity as a first buffer, so it offers a lower return. And the senior tranche uh, being protected by the two previous tranches is less risky and therefore pays a much lower return and is also the tranche that has the highest rating. So in theory, the idea uh, is that by issuing several tranches, you create securities with different levels of risk that can appeal to different types of investors. And, you know, the principle is, is good. And we, 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 we should also note that in the, in the slides, we only displayed three tranches, but in reality, the number of tranches varies and can be much higher. So what are our concerns with tranching? Well, for a start, uh, tranching creates enormous additional complexity. I mean, the senior tranche is what insurance companies call catastrophe risk. You earn a little premium all of the time. You lose very rarely, but when you lose, and it's usually when there is a big market crash, you lose big. And this type of risk is extremely hard because it's incredibly difficult to predict the probability of losing money on this type of investments. I mean, you know, it's so rare, but when it happens, it's so big, it can wipe you out that, you know, it's, it's, it's a very complex type of risk. And yet, most investors just look at the AAA rating and some of them used to consider this type of investment risk-free instead of taking it for what it is, which is really catastrophic risk. Tranching also creates model uncertainty, which means that even banks struggle to determine the value of some of the tranches with their mathematical models. So it means that, yes, it's really, really difficult even for the most professional experts to truly assess precisely the risk of, of these structures. Tranching also creates conflicts of interest between the holders of different tranches. For example, see if you have a, a delinquent mortgage, well, the holder of the equity tranche who will uh, be affected first because he will take the losses first. He will push to renegotiate the mortgage, you know, maybe to extend the payments in order to increase the chance that he will be repaid at all in the end. But in contrast, the holder of the senior tranche will push for foreclosure to, uh, to limit the loss and ensure that he will not be affected personally. And it's exactly what happened during the crisis. So if you have a, a loan that is not securitized, I mean, the banks will typically uh, try to renegotiate. But once the loan is securitized and tranched, then you have different types of investors with different interests and a conflict between them. And lastly, uh, tranching uh, attracts less informed investors, as we discussed, who buy assets that they do not truly understand, as they are lured by the good ratings, and are therefore more likely to panic and sell quickly in times of stress. So for all these reasons, we believe that qualifying securitizations, in order to be truly simple, should not include tranching. That is not to say that tranching should be banned. I mean, tranching is fine. But as to say that the additional level of complexity that it creates does not justify uh, a softening of its prudential treatment and trans-securitization would not be truly simple. Now, our third point is also an essential one. If you recall, uh, one of the key issues uh, before and during the crisis was a so-called originate-to-distribute model where financial institutions granted bad loans not caring, uh, knowing that they would sell them to investors. And in order to prevent that from happening again, uh, it was decided that banks should keep 5% of the securitization that they issued with the hope that this would uh, address this conflict of interest. I mean, if the banks you know, keep some of the securitization, then maybe they will not only securitize the bad loans. That's, that's the idea at the very least. 
And, and this requirement is a very good thing. Now, the issue we have is that, first of all, it is very low, this 5%. But also, uh, as it stands, uh, the requirement leaves a choice for banks between several options. The banks can choose to keep only some of the equity tranche or a bit of each tranche, etc. You have a wide number of options. And it has been found that when banks keep only the equity tranche, this rule does not truly uh, remove the conflict of interest. Because in many cases, the originator already assumes that the equity tranche will be fully consumed by losses. So it is worth nothing. And once it's gone, there is no incentive for the originator to sell good loans to investors. Uh, so for these reasons, we believe that the retention requirement should be 15 or 20 percent. And it should be achieved only through a vertical slice of all tranches or an L-shaped slice. Why 15-20%? Well, 15% is considered by reinsurance companies the, the minimum uh, to um, truly have a, a disciplinary effect and, and, and fully align interest between uh, the originator and, uh, and the investor. Uh, but to, to be discussed, but what is really important here is to have an alignment all the way, not just for the first losses. Uh, this is really important to, to, to remove these conflicts of interest. And as an added benefit, we believe that it will strongly contribute to um, restore investors' confidence in securitization. Um, and like I said, I mean, this is exactly what uh, some reinsurance companies requires from insurance companies when insurance companies transfer uh, catastrophe risk to reinsurance companies. And it's interesting to note in this respect that the insurance is a far more stable business model and maybe there are some lessons to be learned here, not to mention leveling the playing field. And this should not be a problem, frankly, because keeping some of the securitization for the originating bank, well, it's just one investment amongst others. I mean, pro provided that the return is proportional to the risk, they should not have an issue uh, uh, with keeping it. And in fact, we know that in most cases, banks never sell 95% of the securitization. I mean, they rather sell 60 to 70%. So in practice, the impact would not necessarily be uh, that important on the industry. And yet, some, uh, some private stakeholders are currently pushing the commission to lower these requirements to 2% or zero for qualifying securitization. And the reason for that is that some private stakeholders, such as some hedge funds that originate securitization, want to boost their return to the maximum and try to sell everything. But that's not the case of you know, the vast majority of securitization and bank. And, and if anything, we do not see any valid rationale to lower these requirements, because even if the securitization is good quality, well, I mean, you should still you know, want to prevent any possible conflicts of interest. Now, the fourth point uh, that we have is uh, that we fully support the Commission's original exclusion of synthetic securitization from the framework. So, what is synthetic securitization? In a synthetic securitization, the underlying assets are not loans. There are derivative contracts called credit default swaps that are in effect bets. So the bets are like insurance contracts against the non-repayment of a loan or a bond. The buyer of the contract would pay a premium and if the loan is not repaid, he will receive a compensation. So in effect, in, instead of selling the loans to investors, the, the originating bank is buying insurance contracts on the loans from investors. That's, the, that's what is a synthetic securitization. And by doing so, the bank is transferring the risk of non-repayment to investors. But as the loans are not sold, the bank does not receive cash that would enable it to provide more loans. So one key difference is that synthetic securitization does transfer risk but does not finance anything. And also another major point is that as we have seen during the crisis, synthetic securitizations enable financial institutions to create more bets than there are existing loans. And therefore, in the process, they amplify the impact of loan defaults. Because you can indeed create an unlimited number of bets on a given set of reference loans. 
I mean, synthetic securitizations are equivalent to letting all your neighbors buy a fire insurance policy on your house. So not only might it give the wrong incentive to some people, but it also dramatically amplifies the financial impact of your house burning, just as synthetic securitizations enable to create much more securitizations than there were subprime lots. And for all these reasons, we find it essential to maintain the exclusion of synthetic securitization from the qualifying framework and to promote only the securitizations that do finance the real economy and not those that are simply derivative bets amplifying market cycles. Now, once a definition of high quality securitization is agreed upon, the question is then, okay, what do we do with that? Or in other words, how much should we reduce the regulatory capital that investors need to have to absorb potential losses? And while a securitization that would be truly simpler, more transparent and more standardized should be less risky, it would still create additional complexity and risk of contagion compared to other financing channels such as basic loans. So for this reason, it is essential that legislators resist industry pressure to soften excessively the prudential treatment of qualifying securitization. In addition, a recent uh, study by the European Banking Authority found that more than 80% of existing securitizations would not meet the criteria, uh, would, sorry, more than 80% of existing securitization would meet the criteria with reasonable changes. What that means is either that the new framework is not a game changer, or it might also mean that EU securitization is already very good quality. Whatever the reason, this, it, this framework is unlikely to, to have a dramatic to impact based on, on this assessment, and that weakens the case to have a significantly different prudential treatment for SST securitization. As a last point, uh, I want to address the alleged uh, trade-off and opposition between a tight regulatory framework and competitiveness. The argument uh, that uh, is heard sometimes over here is that having a tight framework uh, in Europe would create competitiveness concerns with the US. And we find that um, argument debatable. I mean, we believe, on the contrary, that the commercial success, uh, for example, if you look at the usage framework, uh, which is you know, a framework for money market funds, is a strong evidence that investors value a sound framework. And it, Typically, that soundness and commercial success go hand in hand. And even more so in the case of securitization, because the lack of investor trust has been identified as one of the main impediments to its revival. So a tight securitization framework would precisely restore investors' confidence and thereby contribute to the, the success of the revival. And, and so, I mean, that's, that's a point that we find really important. We have to bear in mind that a sound framework and a truly simple securitization will not impede competitiveness, but really rather restore investor confidence and, and contribute to its success. So thank you very much for listening. That was, in a nutshell, the, 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 the way we look at this initiative and the, the concern and recommendation that we have. Um, we'll now answer uh, any yes. questions that uh, questions are coming in exactly. So, thanks for for making it so synthetic. So that was that was uh, because the subject is quite you know difficult. You, you zoomed on the capital market union, and uh, I mean the finance watch lunch webinar are known to be good digestive pill. And today it was it was a bit the same, but. The question, the first question perhaps I have in my, in my mind as questions are, are coming. Why is the European Commission pushing to revive securitization if it will not help SMEs? This, for me, is something which I don't really, uh, that, that I don't really understand. Uh, well, as, as we discussed earlier, um, in, I mean, it may, at the margin, help SMEs, but as discussed, I mean, we will not be able to create pan-European pools of SME loans. It is likely to 
provide loans that are too expensive for SMEs. So the, the, the main reason from uh, the European Commission perspective is probably the competitiveness reasons, mm. which, as we discussed, is a legitimate reason. But it has nothing to do with financial stability. It has nothing to do with helping SMEs. Uh, and the impact on growth is also a very debatable one. So, so that is to say that there is a valid rationale, but that's not the one being put forward in the mainstream narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So basically, it's really a, a direction and a, a kind of an objective that that we that they try to to achieve in the end. But I mean, it's in a way it's understandable because you know the, we have seen a huge uh, shift in political momentum li linked to the economic context. I mean the. Everywhere you look in Europe these days, uh, the, the focus seems to be clearly on jobs and growth, competitiveness, etc. And and it is fine. Now, what is important is that this focus, you know, does does not have a detrimental impact mm -hmm. on financial yeah. stability, which is a prerequisite for sustainable growth. I mean, you know, we should care and promote jobs and growth, but not in a short-sighted manner. Uh, at you know, at any cost. That's really the the key the key message here. All right. A question by Dominic: uh, Would investors be interested in by non-trench securitization? Would it be too risky for them? Um, well, you have to remember first of all that historically uh, securitization was not trenched. I mean, you know, non-trench securitization enables to transfer risk and to provide funding, just as uh, Trans securitization does. The, what what it what is the difference in practice from an investor's perspective is that the the, the size of the triple rated tranche will be sh smaller for non tranche. But from an investor's perspective, you know if you find that the um, the product does, you know is a bit more risky, well you buy less of it, and then you from a, a book or portfolio perspective, you know you can create the same risk profile by purchasing you know a different quantity etc. and Given the low interest rate context that we are in, and we know that investors are desperate to get yield, and that has had an impact on their asset allocation, etc., uh, which we, we believe that they would have a lot of appetite for this type of products, provided that the the return is proportional to the risk, and that's really the the, the way you should look at it, you know. <laughs> All right. So question are coming in. Let me take. Um, you say that uh, you say that banks are more capitalized, but it's really available, not frozen by regulatory constraint, namely LCR. Question by Benoit. Uh, the banks are more capitalized. That is true. Uh, when it comes to the liquidity ratios, LCR and NSFR, well, we have. We have spoken quite, uh, I mean, we have, uh, yeah, in other context, we have written quite a lot about it. The issue with these liquidity ratios and their current design is that essentially what they do is they tell the banks, okay, you need to have either more liquid assets, that is, you know, liquid tradable securities, or more stable funding. And stable funding, we mean 12 months and one day, and we're not talking 10 years, mm. to ensure that, uh, you know, the possible commitment that you have match your uh, you know the assets available that you have is just a sound management but per se this uh, these requirements basically do not i mean give you the choice between the two and banks tend to choose the former uh, between the uh, the two options that are given to them which they tend to interpret that the, these liquidity ratios as okay we need more liquid assets therefore we will buy bonds for example instead of providing loans but but they could also say, look, you know, instead of uh, funding myself over two days, I will fund myself over twelve months and one day. And if they did that, then they would have no constraint to provide loans. Mm -hmm. The reason they choose the the first option is that uh, by buying liquid tradable assets, these assets can be used as a guarantee to obtain very short term, very cheap funding, which known as repo. But that's a bank's choice again. You know that is not. Uh, something that is imposed by regulation. So, yes, in practice, they may choose to uh, to favor uh, bonds over loans, mm -hmm. but that's 
that's their choice. That's not regulation per se imposing it because regulations leave, give them a choice between more stable funding or more liquid assets. All right. So here we get a question from Richard. Why did you not mention that European securitization has for the most part performed extremely well with minimal losses through and since the crisis? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question from Richard. And it is absolutely true that uh, European securitization had uh, uh, a very low level of losses, I mean, not comparable to the US ones, historically. Now, I mean, we, you know, that's a fact, and, and it reflects the fact that European securitization was higher quality. Now, there are two things I want to say here, is that, first of all, uh, with Europe, Europe has been arguably saved by the bell, in the sense that, if you recall, uh, a number of European member states were about to introduce subprime loans just before the crisis, typically France. I mean, that was on the project of Nicolas Sarkozy, and he, we were saved by the crisis in a way. Another thing is that if you look only at the losses, you're missing part of the issue, because, for example, on top of the losses, when you have rating downgrades, right, you have a AAA tranche that is downgraded to uh, and several notches, then some investors can no longer hold uh, this, this investment because it does not fit into their mandate and they are forced to sell. So the rating downgrades can create um, downward price spirals, you know, fire sales, etc. So that's, you know, that's what I'm saying here is that yes, we have very low losses, uh, but but it's not, I mean, that's not the only concern, it's only part of the picture. Mm -hmm. But then there is there is a question from from Catherine and probably the last one because time is all, almost up. Um, the subprimes are history, so isn't the problem already solved? Um, the subprime mortgages are history, but interestingly enough, what you see what's happening in the US today, uh, we have uh, subprime car loans that are. Um, booming currently. We also have new forms of loans uh, that are more problematic, the so-called covenant light loans, etc. I will not get into this here. But more importantly, uh, if you want a regulation to stand the test of time, to be stable and not to be forced to review it every three years, and you need to take into account the fact that, you know, the market evolves, the product evolves, so you need to ensure that it will not happen. The fact that it's not happening today does not mean it will not happen tomorrow. And what you want is a framework that is sound, robust, and that ensures that it never happens.